Hello, welcome to Nucleus Investment Insights. Uh, so I'm on my own today with a bit of a going to be relatively quick holiday version. Uh, and so uh, I will apologize in advance for uh, for any technical uh, technical issues. But um, I, I wanted, what I wanted to really get into today was talking about uh, some of the problems we're seeing in shipping and inflation risks. So we've got sort of two main events going on at the moment. And uh, I just wanted to raise the issue that that, uh, and just want to address the issues about whether this is going to add to inflation and, and might spark some some um, some issues. Uh, so just a, again as a disclaimer, just noting this is all general advice. Uh, it's not personal advice. Uh, if you do want to get some personal advice, you can uh, tap onto our website and and book yourself in for a call with an advisor. Um, but yeah, everything today is, um, you know, d will not consider your own personal um, circumstances and situations. So the one of the key things I really wanted to focus in on is, um, you know, are we seeing these inflation risks rising? Um, so, you know, we'll talk about the Red Sea. Uh, we're going to talk about um, capacity and um, uh, and issues with the. Um, yeah, we'll talk about goods demand. We'll talk about the flexibility in the system. You know whether they've got some gridflation and, and some of the geopolitics that is all sort of falling in behind this to 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 make it all to come together. So, I mean, the last time um, the Suez Canal was blocked, this was the this was what the uh, you know we saw signs um, of you know big pictures of this uh, ship that that's blocked it. That was sort of like the uh, you know the icon that that was coming all into this inflation that we're seeing, and and you know we're peaking inflation. Uh, we had other things going on. Uh, obviously, we're coming out of pandemic. We've got supply chain issues. All these other factors that are all going into that. But but really, this this image of the the, the Suez Canal being blocked up was was one of the sort of key um, overarching images. And so now the thought that if, if we're seeing now that the Suez Canal is once again blocked up. What does that mean? Does that mean that we're now back into this same type of um, uh, same type of event where where we're not going to be able to we're going to see uh, again inflation inflation spike? So um, and and part of the issue as well is we have the issues in the Panama Canal as well. So if we look at the major shipping choke points, uh, I've just got a, a map of the world up for anyone sort of listening in, and it's sort of showing where the the key lines of shipping are and. and You've got a few around around um, you know the Gibraltar, uh, the Suez Canal, um, the uh, the Straits of Hormuz, uh, Malacca Straits, uh, Panama Canal. But but you know the Panama and Suez are two of the um, the most important ones. And so if they're both going down at the same time or both having uh, issues at the same time, the question is you know what does it actually mean for um, uh, what does it actually mean for Global shipping and and is this going to suddenly mean that we're we're into this other you know, similar to what we saw in the pandemic? Nothing gets delivered on time, therefore prices rise and and sort of you know we, we get into this inflationary spiral coming out of that. So within the Red Sea though, so 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 the Red Sea and then and the Suez Canal. So what we're seeing there is the Houthis firing missiles, attacking ships that are going through. Uh, it's been a little bit um, uh, so so this is coming off the back of they're protesting about. Um, uh, issues happening in in Israel. Uh, the largest shipping companies are starting to avoid um, the, the going through the Red Sea, and so they're they're, they're taking the, the long way around. Uh, this doesn't really affect the oil trade as much. So so the ships uh, to to Asia. So so oil coming um, out of the Middle East, heading a, across to in, into India and and across to China uh, or, or Singapore in terms of processing uh, doesn't. Doesn't go through this um, straight. It does affect oil that's uh, coming from the Middle East through to Europe, uh, and but the biggest effect really is is trade goods um, uh, running through from from Asia to Europe. And look, it costs ships millions to go around. Um, ships to sort of pay, you know, five hundred thousand plus to get through uh, the Suez Canal, and so uh, you, know, you can just tell from from that 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 if you can if ships are willing to pay 500,000 to 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 take the shortcut so to speak um it's going to cost a lot more to go around uh panama canal is running into some some similar issues so uh the issue there is uh, well 
similar in terms of cutting back, their, their issue is that uh, there's droughts which are really affecting the amount of water that ca that uh, can, can be used within uh, the Panama Canal. Uh, they're running at about 24 ships at the moment a day versus 38, so, so significant um, reduction in traffic. Uh, the Panama is about 3% of global traffic. Uh, most of the traffic there is, is either um, uh, energy cargoes, particularly L LNG, or, um, or but, the, but the bigger one is... Uh, is, is any of the goods coming from to the east coast of the US um, uh, through from from Asia and, and China in particular? So, and there's there's tales of, of companies there paying you know four million dollars uh, in order to, to to jump forward in the queue uh, in order to get their ships through earlier. So again, it's 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 a problem for for shipping companies. It takes about two weeks uh, longer if um, for for um, uh, ships to avoid the Panama Canal, so uh, they and it doesn't really make that much difference whether they go via Africa or, or via uh, around the bottom of um, South America. Uh, it sort of adds that extra two weeks, regardless. And and you know for for something like an, an LNG ship, for example, um, it's about an extra two million dollars uh, that it's going to cost in terms of the uh, just the transport to to get the ship from from one place to another. So so reasonable sized issues for for people who want to use these these routes. Now, as a back of the envelope, um, you know, what does this actually do to uh, to prices? So let's say you're a, uh, I guess the, the big message I want to come out is this really affects uh, low value cargo more than it does high value cargo. So oil is a relatively high value cargo. Um, it probably only adds sort of one to 5% to the, to the oil price um that that you're looking at and keeping in mind that this is just the this is just a crude price so you know there's a lot more that goes into uh the final price at the pump in terms of the production uh the refining and then um you know the transport from the refining to the to the service stations and their margins so um you know to the end petrol price you know it, it really is talking a a um uh you know probably less than a percent for um for the, for this type of movements and that's only for ships that did need to go through there so there's a lot of ships obviously that just don't need to go through that that part so so for oil it's not that much of a deal um for container ships it can be a bigger deal uh again that sort of you know could be um you know 10 to 20 percent um uh change in terms of the value for, for a container uh we have seen some container prices starting to jump uh but uh, and the question is whether that sort of spreads to the rest of the world, similar to what we saw during that um, uh, during that real shipping crush. Uh, and then LNG, see, LNG is a lower value cargo than than, than oil, um, uh, so it can add sort of a, a bit a bit more. It can sort of add five to ten percent uh, to LNG, but LNG is a little bit different in terms of um, it. It's it's got some more locations. Uh, well, I. I guess there's some some big differences. There's some big areas which produce LNG. Now, Qatar is one, uh, Australia is another, and the US, um, both East Coast and West Coast. And so, for some part, it, it is a. It might just be more about how uh, the LNG is getting shipped around. So it might be more about getting you know more LNG um, from from US West. Uh, yeah, from the US. Uh, East Coast, sorry, which um, can go straight through to Europe, so it doesn't actually need to go through any of these passes, and, and rather than uh, going through um, uh, the Panama Canal and getting across to, into Asia, and then more Qatari gas or more Australian gas ends up in um, in Asia, and so for some for some part, you know, there, there will be a shuffling around in terms of the LNG, but. Um, yeah, you know, there's the other part is well, are we going to run short because because now we've got this LNG needs to spend um, say an extra week or two weeks uh, on a ship? Does that then turn into problems? Uh, yeah, it might have done if and it may 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 do if we run into uh, into shortages. The issue is we really don't have shortages at the moment, and so because we don't have the shortages, uh, that sort of means that uh, it's not as much of an issue. Similar with oil, so you know, there's it's it's positive for oil demand. Uh, doesn't mean that oil is going to spend a little bit more on the on the ocean, a bit longer. Um, we've also got you know that's that's on top of the the oil um, the amount of extra time that that oil is spending on the ocean because of the Russia uh, needing to sort of go from rather than going from Russia through to, through to Europe that um, it's a lot of Russian oil is is ending up in Asia and that's spending a lot longer. So so it does sort of add to that problem. Having said that though. Um, yeah, you know, there's again. It's a relatively small part of the price, and uh, uh, you know, it, it doesn't affect that sort of main trade of of of, of coming out of um, uh, the Middle East in, into into Asia. Um, 
yeah, I might go to a quick message. We'll be back with the investment insights very shortly. Nucleus Wealth is an active and passive investment manager. If you like what you're hearing and want some help with the investing, we can do it for you via our active portfolios. Our tactical and core portfolios use the insights shared in this podcast to construct and manage your investment. We blend tactical portfolios to offer our combinations of international shares, Australian shares, government bonds, and cash. We vary the asset allocation with the goal of protecting your capital in times of market uncertainty. We also have active international and Australian share portfolios. These are chosen using our quality and value investment philosophy. You can find out more at NucleusWealth.com. Now back to the show. So, okay, so what we really need to think about from here, though, is, is can this get worse? And absolutely. Look, um, Iran could escalate the, uh, this. The Houthis are, are, are backed by Iran. Uh, Iran is also backing Hamas. Iran is also backing Hezbollah. Uh, all of them are, are sort of pointing at Israel and, and uh, the, the whole idea behind that. Um, you know, can, can the geopolitics get worse? Yes, it can. Having said that, um, Iran is in this position at the moment where it's managed to get pretty much everything at once without actually having to risk any of its own um, own, its own troops and, and not a lot of its own sort of uh, uh, you know, economic clout in terms of exports and, and, and things like that. Because what, it, what it's effectively done is, uh, it, if, you, if you look at this whole uh, geopolitical event in Israel as being effectively that uh, Israel and Saudi Arabia were looking to get put together a partnership um, in in concert with the US, where Saudi Arabia would get more US support, uh, military support in particular. Uh, in return, they would recognise Israel and 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 you know reach uh, much closer relationships with them, and uh, and and so. Uh, and that sort of would have meant that all three of them were then uh, against Iran in 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 the Middle East and and you know a change in the balance of power. So Iran was really what it was really trying to do was was disrupt that, and so it's backed Hamas to to attack Israel with the view that Israel would then retaliate uh, and kill lots of um, uh, Arabs and sort of come over the top in terms of their retaliation, and that would then mean that it, it became much, much harder for, for Saudi Arabia to do a deal um, because uh, you know, their own population is seeing Arabs killed by, um, uh, by Israel. And that's largely come to pass. And so, uh, so Iran has effectively got what it's wanted without having to risk its own oil, without having to risk its own troops. And uh, and again, this is sort of just through a proxy. It's got the Houthis, you know, attacking the uh, the shipping going through, uh, and and it really hasn't affected Iran at the moment. So it's probably you, and 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 you know, logic doesn't always um, play the biggest part when it comes to geopolitics, but Iran has really got what it's looking to get. So the question now is, you know, will they? Will they try to escalate? And, and you would think that the logical answer would probably be no, but you know maybe maybe um, you know the logical doesn't always come true. So we do need to keep an eye out in terms of that, and that's going to then much uh, that's going that that would affect oil in a much bigger way. So so really, what's happening at the moment is not particularly affecting oil. Uh, the next step um, to remember, though, in terms of this is that. Uh, thinking about the capacity side. So we showed this chart um, a few weeks uh, ago when we looked at um, sales in, in more detail. And I've just got a chart up which is showing the uh, container ship deliveries uh, from over the last sort of 25 years. And so for anyone who's listening in, you know, it, it was sort of running at, at about, about a million uh, TEUs a year uh, for you know, most of the, the um, you know, 2006 through to, through the 2015. Uh, drop back down, or sorry, probably a million and a half, sorry, drop back down to sort of closer to a million for, for a decade. Um, and it's just rocketed. It's up, up over um, over 2 million for 2023. 2024 is looking like being two two and a half to, to $3 million. The issue is container ship um, capacity has expanded greatly. So the problem that we might have run into is uh, even though you know, not that much shipping is going through. Maybe ten to fifteen percent of shipping is going to be affected by these two uh, these two issues. Is that there's a flow on effect of the ship that was meant to be um, uh, you know in port two weeks ago, then means that the next cargo doesn't get picked up, and then the next one doesn't get picked up, and it starts to it all starts to build up, and you get this um, 
uh, like a traffic jam effect where, you know, first car slowing and the next one slows and then everyone needs to slow down before finally it, it speeds up again. But the issue is as, as we're worried about that, we've actually got this flood of new shipping coming on and there's uh, the questions about how we're looking at at um, uh, sorry, ship owners looking to need to just scrap some of the older ships in order to take capacity out of the system. So capacity is not as much of an issue. Um, maybe LNG. LNG is still sort of um, a little bit more scrambling for capacity there, but um, but again, capacity is growing quite quickly in that area. So uh, yeah, I, and that's off the back of some more LNG needed for for Europe. Um, but you know, really, the capacity side is is nowhere near as much of a problem as it was last time we saw this. Um, we saw this run through. The next issue is the goods demand. Now, depending upon how you look at goods demand, what you can see with that is that um, when you look at sort of some of the bigger picture goods de demand, um, particularly the, the the numerical versions. Goods demand still holding up, not too bad. And you look at the the numbers and and, and you know. And uh, there's, there's still a, a reasonable amount of growth in terms of dollars. The issue is because we've been running with such high inflation rates, uh, that's been masking what's going on in terms of the amount of um, uh, the goods that, have, that are going through and uh, the volume side. So, so yeah, so, so the dollar value might, might have risen um, you know, by you know, 2% or 3%, but if you've got 5% or 6% or, or inflation, then that's actually meant that the amount of your... Um, uh, the actual, yeah, the actual volume of the goods has been falling, and that's what we've seen for the last few quarters. Um, is that we've seen a falling amount of goods. So, so again, it's this this issue. Um, and sorry, and what I've, the chart I've got up is is showing uh, global trade uh, fall. So some of this is is a little bit of onshoring as well as is starting to kick in, and so there's 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 a little bit less um, global trade going going through. So, but what that all sort of adds up to is okay, we're not reaching this point. We're not at this sort of crush point where we're trying to order all these goods just as we're having supply chain problems and just as you know the, 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 we really hit a perfect storm in that in that prior case where the, the ship got stuck in the Suez um, of everything sort of going wrong all, all at once. Whereas what we're seeing is the capacity side is no real issues there. The goods demand is sort of helping us out. Um, so yeah, so then then you move on to the inventory cycle and really we've seen a destocking. Um, that's probably the the big message is that. Um, in terms of the inventory cycle is that we're not seeing, we've spent the last year where companies have been pulling back on the amount of goods that they, um, uh, amount of goods that they've got in the, in their inventories. And that sort of means we go through this inventory cycle. Um, now I've spoken about this a few times before. I've got a chart up that just sort of, just to try and illustrate this. Um, and so what I'm, what I'm showing is that if you think about, uh, an inventory as being sort of three stages, a retailer, a wholesaler, and a manufacturer. And so the retailer needs to, you know, they, they sell the goods, they they order them from a wholesaler, and the, the wholesaler then orders from the manufacturer. And if you're in this steady state, um, you know, the retailer sells 100 goods, um, and I've got them in, you know, with 150 sitting in their inventory, um, and that, so they, they basically want one and a half times their inventory, whether this is weekly or monthly or whatever it is, um, you know, varies for different for different industries, but you know you've got a mount in your inventory, and you've got a mount that you, you're selling every every period. You then order that from the the, the wholesaler, and the, the wholesaler's also got their own inventory, so they've got their own sales and inventory, and then they order from the manufacturer all the way down. So in a steady state, it all just ticks over. The issue is, um, it's you get what's called a whip um, a whip effect, where uh, it uh, small changes at one end at the retailer actually have an outsized effect on, on the others. And I've used uh, an example on, on screen to sort of, sort of show you, okay, so we go through these couple of periods. Let's say in period four, um, we see that our sales drops uh, from, from 100 back to 90. And so now the idea is that, well, actually we don't need, um, so, so, so now we end up with an extra 10 sitting in our inventory. So we wanted 150 items sitting in our inventory. Now we've got 160. But if I'm expecting that, uh, goods are going to stay low. Well, and I'm only keeping, um, you know, 1.5 times my inventory. Well, I, I actually don't need 150 goods anymore. I'm not 10 over. I'm actually, I actually only need 135 sets of goods to be back at that 1.5 times ratio. So, you know, I'm, you know, say this is our weekly. It's like whatever I'm selling every week. I just, I want one and a half times of that sitting in my, in my inventory. And so, 
I actually need to go back from 160 back to back to 35. So while my sales has only dropped by 10, um, what I need to order now because I've got all this extra, I only need to order um, 65 from my from my wholesaler, and then I'll go back to ordering 90 every, every time as, as, a, as a sell. So then the wholesaler though has exactly that same problem. So they've had a so the, the retailers dropped 10, wholesalers dropped 35. Um, now he's going to order from his from the manufacturer, and, and the numbers are up and showing. And now the manufacturer, um, the wholesaler is actually only ordering forty from the from the manufacturer. So the the, the small effect of of, of ch changing ten units at at the uh, retail end ended up with a, a forty at the manufacturing end, and that's really what we've been going through for the past um, uh, for the past year is the other side of this destocking cycle, and this is a um, Keeping in mind as well that this is, uh, uh, it works in the opposite direction as well. You get the upside when you go the other direction. So, so a small change in retail sales, once it starts to pick up, when you go back from 100 to 110, uh, then you, you get the other side of that and, and, and you know, that's happy days for, for manufacturers. But that's not where we are today. So today we're at this problem. And, and for the last year, we've been at this problem, this, this destocking problem. And so, uh, and, and so that's why, um, you know, so that's, I guess that's what I'm trying to say is that's something else, else we need to keep an eye on is that if, if the inventory cycle turns, then that could become an issue. Uh, and, and there's there's potentially the inventory side is, is 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 bottoming at least. Um, it certainly doesn't seem to be, there doesn't seem to be any signs of turning up, but it does seem as if that the uh, the destocking side is is getting close to over if, if, if not sort of, you know, reaching a sort of more neutral uh, position. We'll be back again shortly. If you like what you're hearing but want a low-cost passive option, Nucleus Wealth is the first to offer passive direct indexing in Australia. The first generation of passive investing was index funds. The next gen was ETFs. Now direct indexing is here with significantly more customization and control. The benefit of direct indexing is you can add or subtract investment themes, and we have almost 100 different options to choose from. For example, you could buy an international share direct index portfolio that excludes fossil fuels and arms manufacturers and has a tilt towards cybersecurity and cloud computing. Alternatively, you could buy a portfolio with no screens and an extra exposure to nuclear power and defense contractors. You can find out more at nucleuswealth.com. Now back to the show. So a couple of other things to add to uh, to this now as well is some of the other things we're seeing is that uh, yeah, could could we receive? Could we use, could this spark a, a return to greedflation? Yeah, absolutely. That's that's probably the, the the biggest thing we should be watching out for. Is is does this mean that companies who haven't really seen much of the way in terms of increase in costs can turn around and say, um, oh, you know, shipping costs are up, Panama Canal, Red Sea, Suez Canal. You know, I've got to put my prices up by by five percent or ten percent. Um, yeah, maybe. That's that's a, that is definitely a, a possibility. Uh, so, this, so we need to watch out for that. We are seeing um, some pretty decent size signs of price wars breaking out, and we're starting to see deflation in in goods um, around the world. So, uh, you know, this will be a, a question on on that front. Uh, so, so sorry. So, so I guess on on the goods side, I probably see it harder to to get to because we uh, we yeah. We have seen an expansion of capacity, and we are seeing price wars, and so it's 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 hard to put your prices up while you're also trying to have a price war over over volumes. Uh, maybe more so in in services sector. So you might see maybe some services companies that that um, are jacking their prices even though they don't need to. Um, so you know maybe if your um, you know, cup of coffee goes up by five percent in terms of the cost, and you know discussion about shipping and all this type of stuff like that, and in the end it's like yeah, look really the the cost of uh, you know the, the cost of the the actual coffee in your coffee cup um, is such a tiny proportion of the overall. You know, if you're buying a a five dollar latte, you know the, the actual coffee cost is is a fraction of that cost. You know, all the other cost is is really services. And so if they're going to you know justify putting up the, the their prices by five percent because of that, um, you know that's that's the greenflation part. And so we need to keep an eye on that. But it's um, it does seem to be. Uh, um, yeah, well, that, sorry, that's 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 sort of your main argument against. A couple of other arguments um, for for seeing less of an effect is look, the system is much more flexible now as well. I think there's there's sometimes um, uh, you know you can you can fight the last war, and so the part of the issue 
a lot when we did see this whole inflation spike was we we had all these things working the other direction we had an inventory rebuild so that was all going in the opposite direction we had a um uh, we we had goods growth spiking to, to to these massive levels. We had uh, not as much flexibility in the system. People didn't expect that, that, that the top of this this type of thing might happen, and uh, capacity was low. And so, whereas all those are the other direction at the moment, and so the system is we've just been through this you know one of the worst effects on on global supply chains ever. And so, there's a lot of money has been put into supply chains. A lot of money has been put into uh, trying to speed things up and and and, and efficiencies, uh, it is a lot more flexible than it used to be, and so these types of events I don't expect to have anywhere near this, the 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 the, uh, the effect they did um, last time around. Uh, and if you look at the supply chain, um, some of the measures of supply chain, look, these aren't completely up to date. So I've got a chart just sort of showing the um, this is the US measure. Uh, I think it's a, the New York Fed runs this survey and, and looks at supply chain uh, pressures and, and, and measured as sort of um, it, it, sorry, global supply chain pressure indexes is what it's got. And now this is only back to, to November. So it does capture um, Panama issues. It doesn't really capture the, or it doesn't capture the, some of the latest issues we have in shipping, uh, but, but we're coming from a neutral position. And so that's where, uh, you know, it's one thing from coming from an already high position and, and um, stress. So, so you know, there's, there's not a lot, of, um, a lot of issues. We'll be back with the Investment Insights very shortly. Oops, sorry, apologies. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that sort of leads us. So I've got an, so we'll talk about the investment view in a minute. But first, sort of, uh, we've got the question of the week. So something for uh, people to. We'll be back with the Investment Insights very shortly. Sorry, well, uh, apologies for that. It's something for people to discuss in the in the in the comments. Uh, you know, are are the supply chains uh, ready to break uh, again? So my view is, look, I don't think they are. Um, I think there are issues in terms of, um, like this is a concern. Like it, it's it could be the start of something, then, but you're going to need a lot of other things um, to to then cause problems. So, uh, for for my part, you know. I'm not saying it's a nothing issue. It's certainly something that you, that you should be aware of as an investor. But uh, but I, there's a lot of other dominoes that would need to fall before this turns into something major that's going to going to affect supply chains. But yeah, certainly interested to hear from people who uh, who have different views and uh, pop them in up up in the comments. So with that. Um, uh, you know, if you if you uh, if you want to see more content uh, content from Nucleus, you can uh, go to nucleuswealth.com slash content. Uh, if you've got any ideas for new for shows or topic suggestions, you will leave a comment on our YouTube pages. Uh, if you if you want to listen to this as a podcast, you can find us on all the major systems: uh, Apple, Google, Spotify, uh, and you know, we're on a bunch of different social media. And we write and blog a lot of the time, so we're more than happy to uh, to hear from people. And certainly, would love to see your comments on on the videos. With that, we'll leave it at that for this week. Thank you very much.